Welcome to OnlineOralSurgery.com, the site on the internet for online oral surgery training for both the practicing general dentist and the dental student who want to improve their skills and knowledge of oral surgery. My name is Jay Resnick and I am a board certified oral and maxillofacial surgeon and I practice in Tarzana, California, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. My involvement with teaching general dentists about oral surgery began in 2003 when I first became involved with the website Dentaltown.com. And I have to admit that as an oral surgeon practicing in suburban Los Angeles, I guess I led a pretty sheltered life. I thought that every general dentist had an oral surgeon right down the street that they could refer a patient to whenever they had an emergency or if they had a question, they could give them a call. It was only through answering lots of posts on Dentaltown and answering lots of emails that I came to realize that where I practiced probably represented only about 10% of all the dentists practicing in the United States. The majority of dentists practiced in areas where the closest oral surgeon was an hour away, and there was about a two-month wait for a routine consultation, and you could totally forget about sending a patient in an emergency. And in my area, just about everybody's a cosmetic dentist and does Invisalign and owns a CEREC and whatever else you can think of, whereas in 90% of the country, the average general dentist basically does nuts and bolts dentistry. And that includes a lot of minor oral surgery and dealing with infections and in some cases even tackling impacted wisdom teeth. And I remember how much oral surgery I actually learned in dental school. If I was a general dentist faced with having to take out a broken down tooth all by myself with only the training that I got in dental school, there would be no way that I'd be able to do it with any kind of confidence. And in a lot of countries other than the United States, things are even worse. Someone may be the only dentist in their village or their town for hundreds of miles and even if they could get the patient to a specialist, the patient has no way to even get there. So this website is for you. By taking advantage of all that we have to offer here, you're going to improve your knowledge of oral surgery, improve your clinical skills, and be able to feel as comfortable doing oral surgery as you do doing restorative dentistry. Just to remind you of how little you actually know about oral surgery, I'm going to remind you of how little education you really got on the subject. In the second year, you probably had a lecture course that went uh, about an hour once a week. And then you got into the third and fourth year, and you did uh, clinical rotations, uh, either one anywhere from one to three weeks. And maybe you took out uh, two easy teeth a day with the assistance of an instructor. And then if you did a hospital rotation, you may have gotten a little bit more experience taking out maybe three or four teeth in a day but generally the more complicated extractions were left for the resident to do. And that basically was all the instruction that most of you got in oral surgery before you were thrown out into the general practice world. Now if you were in the military or you did a general practice residency, then you probably did get a little bit more extensive training in basic oral surgery and exodontia, but certainly not the training that an oral surgeon goes through. A typical oral surgeon who trained in the last 20 years or so also went through four years of dental school like you, but then did a four-year hospital-based residency in oral and maxillofacial surgery, which also included about six months of general anesthesia training, uh, at least three to six months of general surgery and other surgical subspecialties, about three months of internal medicine, and probably at least two years of basic and advanced oral and maxillofacial surgery, including complicated exodontia. For those of us crazy enough to go on and get our medical degrees, too, we also did uh, some type of internship, most likely a year of general surgery or internal medicine, uh, in order to get our medical licenses. And then there are even some oral surgeons who have done fellowships in things like craniofacial surgery or orthognathic surgery or trauma or TMJ or cosmetic surgery. So you can see that there's a tremendous difference between what the typical general dentist and the average oral and maxillofacial surgeon gets when it comes to basic exodontia, complicated exodontia, and other office-based oral surgery. And so it should be obvious to you that no matter how much you use this website and how many of these courses that you take, that there's absolutely no way that in a few hours or more that I can make you an oral and maxillofacial surgeon but I can try to make you think like one. And that means looking at each patient the way an oral surgeon would, evaluating the patient's medical history, analyzing the radiographs, planning the procedure from start to finish, going through all the steps in your head so you know exactly what instruments you're going to need and what the potential complications are, and so you know ahead of time how you're going to manage them before they even occur. So now that you've paid your money and signed up for this website, I want to ask you, should you really be doing oral surgery? And the answer to that is going to be different for every single person who's signed up on this site. 
The first thing to consider is, you know, what is your experience and comfort level in doing oral surgery procedures? And if your only training is what you got in dental school, you're not going to be as comfortable as if you had done a general practice residency or been in the military, where you may be quite experienced at doing oral surgery. Another factor is what else is going on in your practice? Are you busy doing restorative and cosmetic procedures where taking the time to do oral surgery procedures may cut into your production? Or do you have a great variety of patients that come your way and many of them do need extractions? Also, how close are the specialists in your area? Are there oral surgeons that you can refer to easily, or is it very difficult for you to get the patient in to see an oral surgeon in a timely fashion if you need to send a patient? And, of course, you do want to make money doing oral surgery, and so you have to be able to do things efficiently. You should be able to do a straightforward extraction in about 15 minutes, and an impacted tooth should really take no more than a half hour on your schedule. If you go beyond those times, you're really losing money on every case that you do, and you can't make it up in volume. Whenever you do surgery, even if you do it perfectly, there still is a chance of complications. And are you prepared to deal with those complications? And then when you've dealt with the complications to the best of your ability and you still are having problems, do you have backup from a specialist so that worse complications don't occur? And even if you are prepared to deal with the complications of surgery, is this something you really want to do? Because, as I said, no matter how good you are, you will have complications. And patients who have complications are usually not very happy. And is that something that you want to deal with in your office? And the reason this is all important is because a general dentist doing oral surgery is held to the same standard of care as the specialist. So if you want to take out a full bony distoangular impaction of tooth number 17, you better be well trained to do it and do it as well as the oral surgeon. And if complications occur, to be able to handle the complications just as well. Hopefully one of the things you'll learn from this website is good case selection. You don't have to take out every single tooth and do every single procedure that comes your way, but I want you to do the ones that you do as well as can possibly be done. And I want you to be as well prepared for the procedure as you can possibly be. And so just because you have an opening in your schedule and the patient needs the procedure doesn't mean that you should not refer the patient. There are going to be plenty of cases where the best thing for you to do is to treat the patient in your office, but there are also plenty of times when that can be the worst thing to do. As a specialist, one of my primary goals of practice is to have every single patient that's referred to me go back to their general dentist and rave about what a wonderful experience they had in my office and how easily and pain-free their surgery went. Well, in general practice, it's really no different. You want everything that you do in your office to be a practice builder, not a practice destroyer. Once or twice a month, I get a patient referred to me by the general dentist who was in the chair having a tooth extracted. And the dentist thought they were doing the patient a favor at first until uh, about a half hour later, they still hadn't gotten the tooth out. Occasionally I get somebody who's been in the dentist chair for over an hour attempting an extraction. By the time the patients get to my office, they're exhausted, they're starting to have pain, and they've lost total confidence in their dentist. And then they put me in the awkward position of asking me if I can refer them to a new dentist. I don't want this to ever happen to you. Know your limitations and know when to refer. Referring the patient to the right specialist makes you look great to the patient and they'll be a patient of yours for life, and they'll refer all their friends and family. Remember the old adage that a happy patient will tell two of their friends, but an unhappy patient will tell ten of them. In surgery, the consultation is extremely important, and one of the key elements of the consultation is going over the surgical consent. But the surgical consent is not this form that the doctor fills out and the patient signs. The surgical consent is the process by which the doctor discusses with the patient the recommended treatment along with its risks, its benefits, its complications, as well as the alternatives, including no treatment. This is a copy of the basic consent for surgery and anesthesia that I use in my practice. I reviewed a couple dozen consent forms and basically put this together myself. And what it does, it lists the most common complications and side effects of basic oral surgery and then has a little paragraph explaining each one. And when I discuss surgery in my office with a patient, we go over each and every one of these potential risks and complications. And I make sure that the patient understands them. Also, there's a provision on the consent form that allows me to biopsy, if indicated, any abnormal or pathological look looking tissue that I may encounter during their procedure. It also allows me to manage any complications that may occur during surgery or afterwards. You also need to discuss with the patient the ramifications of not following through with the treatment that you're recommending. In addition, we discuss with the patient the options for replacing the tooth that's going to be removed. 
We never had to do that before dental implants, but dental implants have changed the practice of dentistry. The implants are now the treatment of choice to replace missing teeth, especially when you're replacing single teeth following extraction. We discuss with the patient the difference between a bridge versus an implant versus a removable appliance versus doing nothing. And I also discuss ridge preservation, especially if they're interested in replacing the tooth with an implant. You should also give the patient the option of being treated by a specialist for their problem. That may not be the most expedient or the most practical or the most economical, but you need to give them that option as part of the informed consent process. Because if you do have a complication and you did not give the patient that option, it may be very hard to defend yourself in the case of litigation. Another form that we use in the office, uh, fortunately not too often, is the informed refusal. And this is basically used when a patient refuses a treatment that you feel is necessary and that failure to have the procedure may result in life-threatening or health-threatening complications. In this case, you want to have the patient sign a form stating that they've been informed of all the consequences of their decision and they still refuse to have the treatment performed. Even if you watch every single minute of video on this website and take every single course I've made available, you still want to have a working relationship with an oral and maxillofacial surgeon in your area because there are going to be cases that you don't want to do, there are going to be patients you don't want to treat, and should you unfortunately have a complication that you're not able to handle, you want to have someone that you trust that will be there to back you up and help you out. And that means it's a two-way street. Even if you do a lot of your own oral surgery, you're still going to need the specialist from time to time. And most definitely, the oral surgeon needs you because the general dentist is every specialist's primary source of new patients. So by having a good working relationship with your local oral maxillofacial surgeon, you benefit the oral surgeon benefits, and most importantly, the patient benefits.